seated. Uh, it's so good to see you today. Um, what a blessing it is to see such a full house on this beautiful autumn morning. Hope that extra cup of coffee and that extra hour of sleep has you ready to go. You know, I say that extra hour of sleep, those of you who have little ones at home, uh, babies really don't understand daylight savings time. And so some of our moms are like, speak for yourself, buddy. But it's great to see you today. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Charlie Kimes uh, for filling in here. Charlie is one of the most excellent ministers that I have ever encountered. Uh, and in his years of ministry at Broken Arrow and at Crosstown, uh, if I ever went to a hospital to visit somebody, uh, Charlie Kimes was there. And so I am very, very thankful that Charlie did an excellent job bringing the Word of God this past week. It has been a fantastic week here at Park. Uh, the pumpkin patch, bigger and better than ever. Uh, I would be remiss. Our pumpkin patch would not happen without the Lord. Key Elementary would not be blessed without the Lord working through that. The way that God works in our pumpkin patch in blessing Key Elementary and letting this neighborhood know that this church cares not only about Africa and Asia and Australia, but also the adjacent neighborhood. God works through Bob and Dwayne Petrie. Guys, thank you for all that you do. They, they don't want that acknowledgement, but they're going to get it anyway. Uh, there are so many things at this church that without the Petrie's involvement, uh, we, we, we'd be in trouble. Love and appreciate their hearts. Pumpkin Patch was great, Trunk of Treats, the Spoon family. We had more trunks than we have ever had. Uh, it was an outstanding uh, community outreach event. Celebrate Recovery this past Friday night. Craig Loney will talk about that more in our response time. Baptism's going on this week as usual here at Park. We rejoice in that. And then this next week, Central Campus. Get ready, because it is time for launch. It is time for a remissioning of our efforts, a redoubling of focusing in on what God is doing in our lives and through this place. So next Sunday, November 9th, I pray that this week that you are in prayer, because we want to more than ever get after it, so to speak, when it comes to reaching this community for Christ. Amen, church? And we are praying unto that end. And one thing that we are going to do, one thing that neighbors do is they have people into their home. And so this next Sunday at 5.30 p.m., aren't you glad it's not 5.30 a.m., all right? 5.30 p.m., we are going to welcome the cards have gone out, the invitations have gone out. We're going to welcome this neighborhood into our home. Not so much to speak within the confines of this auditorium, but a more inviting situation outside. And so in our west and our north parking lots, we're going to have tailgating going on. Out on the front lawn, I'm excited about this, we're going to have a cookout going on. We've got our, you say, now who's running all this? Is this Ed just behind the grill flipping hot dogs as fast as he can? Our classes and our community groups have all signed up to sponsor, to bring lawn chairs, to bring their grills, to bring the food, and bring more than enough so that the friends you invite and that the friends that just come from our neighborhood that the postcards have invited, that word has gotten out to, that we say, hey, brought an extra folding chair, come on and sit down. We need you to bring two things next week. We need you to bring folding chairs and a flexible spirit. Come with a mindset that I am showing up, and if they want me to wash feet, I'm washing feet. If they want me to paint the steeple, well, maybe not that, but if they want me to do anything, I want to come and make sure that this is a place where when the people of this adjacent neighborhood pass by, they say, now that church, they love people. That church, one thing I do know about them is that they love each other. And we begin to invite them in with that welcoming spirit. So church, be ready for that and keep that in your prayers. On that note, we want to return one last time. We're going to start a new series next week as we relaunch and launch this campus. I Am Light, that will be the series next week that will begin. But one last Sunday on this topic of remissioning. Not letting ourselves fall into mission creep. Well, we're doing good things. Well, yeah, these are great things we're doing. But are they God things we're doing? 
Are they the things God has called us to be about and going out and letting Him work on us and through us as He seeks and saves the lost through His body, which is the church? One of the greatest ways that we can be about remissioning is remembering not only, not only Matthew 28, the Great Commission, we need to be people who remember God's original mission. Not for us, so to speak, but what his original mission was and now how we participate and join him in that. Well, well, Mitch, what was God's original mission? Was that found at the beginning of Matthew instead of the end of Matthew? Well, you can find it there. But if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and 26, you see God creating a people that are in his image. In other words, creating a people that are in his likeness. It's not too long in the story after that that man, having free will, introduces sin. And that image is tainted, that image is perverted, that image is confused. And it's hard to see God. In fact, in a few chapters it says that God was grieved that he even got into this. But he hangs in there. He's got this agape, unconditional love that is persistent and tough and perseveres. And so God continues to not only redeem man, we talk a lot about that in the church, but we need to also talk about a God who is restoring His image in man through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and through His Word that provides direction and living in those ways. Today we're called to be, in other words... Image bearers for God, put in more simpler terms, we're called to be like Jesus. Because when Jesus came and dwelt among men, He lived this out and was the only one who lived this out perfect. Not just in what He did, but in the way that He did it. He was living water. He was a blessing. He was truth. He was holiness. And we're called to look at Him and follow that example. We're called to be people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit where that is actually something that is possible in our lives more and more. Philippians 2 and 5 says this, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. That word attitude there could be translated. In fact, some versions of the Bible do translate your thinking and your actions. Because today attitude has become this inner how I'll present myself, happy, I'll turn that frown upside down and I'll have a good attitude. That's part of it, but it's more than that. Your thinking and your actions should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4, 23 through 24 says, You, however, this is kind of unlike others, you, however, are to be made new in the attitude in the thinking and the actions of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God. And we know God is Emmanuel, God with us, none other than Christ. You're called to be like Jesus in true righteousness and holiness. Moments ago, Craig read Ephesians 5 and 1, be imitators of God. In another way, said, be like Jesus. This is our mission. It was a year ago from this past Friday night to give them a little bit of slack. My door was not shut like I thought it was. It was cracked a little bit, but I was unaware of it. One thing I love about Halloween, I don't enjoy so much. I enjoy it, but not as much. I I get a kick out of the kids that come around at 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, but I like the kids that come around around 5.30, all right? Because these are the ones that can barely walk and they're holding a sack that's bigger than their body. They're the ones that have the mom, the dad, and the grandparents all taking pictures. The kid has no idea what's going on, but he's getting candy and, you know, just kind of walking on. He's got the best costume ever. Some grandma has made it handmade. And years later, he's going to buy something at Walgreens. But this kid looks cute. So it's 5.30 a year ago. Doors cracked open. I wasn't ready for trick-or-treaters yet. Our candy was ready, but I wasn't ready. I'm in the recliner watching something. Some parents, I found out later, got into a conversation out in the street, had seen some friends, and they're talking it up. I don't know if they were three, four, or five, or four, five, or six, but Grover 
Spider-Man and President Obama were on a mission, all right? <laughs> I'm in my recliner. Door comes open. Labrador Retriever, Great Dane. Grover, President Obama, Spider-Man, unintimidated. Into my house. <laughs> they come on in. I'm kind of sitting there with the remote control. This is different. <laughs> They come on in, candy out, they're in my den now. <laughs> one's, one's, Grover gets out, the youngest, the spokesman of the group, trick or treat, President Obama, give us candy. And there they are. <laughs> I find out that they're actually explaining to me the routine. We say trick or treat and then you give us candy. I think I got this, kids, all right? Parents are now at the door apologizing profusely. Come back, come back, come back. Big dogs, come back, all right? Man in strange t-shirt with shorts on, you know, in his house. The kids go back. Grover looks back at me. He's all of four. He's, I mean, he's the boss, youngest one. He goes, don't I look like Grover? You nailed Grover, kid. You got it, all right? As I, as I remember that story, that, that, that really plays up what we're talking about today. The, the parents had kind of forgotten what they were about. They were out there having fellowship. The kids, candy, 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 candy. They're on a mission. They're getting after it, and they're also concerned, Grover was also concerned about, do I actually reflect who I'm trying to be? We're called to be people who move into the lives of others, and what did Ephesians 4 say? We put on a new self. Paul would later say, we clothe ourselves with Christ inside and out. It's not just some costume we put on at Halloween or on Sunday mornings. Because of the Holy Spirit in us, we're reflecting Jesus, and we're people who are very clearly not caught up in just a fellowship out on the streets. We're trying to enter people's lives and be on a mission of engagement. This morning, three challenges for you as we live out God's mission in and through our lives. In being like Jesus, number one, we're called to be people who understand relationships are a priority. Well, you want to talk about priority. Did you hear about what several towns uh, up in Ohio and down in Texas did about this past Friday night? Decatur, Texas is a great example. They didn't have Halloween on Friday night. They moved it to Thursday. Now, why would a Texas town move Halloween from Friday to Thursday? It's football. We got priorities. I mean, hey, we've got to keep things straight. Jesus would have understood that. He had a place to go. He had things to do. He had an offering to make. He had a Sabbath to keep. These are priorities. But whenever people showed up, the Sabbath would get kicked to the side. Whenever people showed up, well, we can glean from this field because these people are hungry. Whenever people showed up, oh, no, keep that leper over there. And Jesus said, how about I go over there and we don't just talk, but I touch. Jesus was one who engaged people. And to be like Jesus, we need to be people who understand. As the message put it in John 1 and 14, the Word became flesh and blood and it moved into the neighborhood. That's what we're talking about doing next week. We're talking, Mitch, I thought we were cooking hot dogs. That is a means to an end. I don't care if we eat one hot dog as long as we engage and move into the neighborhood again. Let us be people who understand that Jesus touched the leper, He addressed the needs, He fed the hungry, He spent time with the lonely, He wept with the hurting, He lifted up the downtrodden, He sat down at our tables and He passed the bread. Jesus invested in people, and for us to be like Him, which is our call, we must remission ourselves, redouble our efforts to relationships. Now, church, we need to understand this. We live in a world where that is easier said than done. This world more and more is geared towards isolation and the divesting of relationships. Entertainment, sports, TV, media, work, and counterfeit relationships that come through technology are competing against our relationships, even starting, but even more so, they just want to keep them at a shallow level and not moving to any type of a depth. It's over two weeks ago. I'm blessed 
to be there at my dad's bedside in the sixth floor of a Tyler hospital. He is down to his last 30 minutes of breath in this life. You know what my dad did not ask for? Did not say, Mitch, how's the 401k doing? Mitch, how's the bank account doing? Mitch, this upcoming election, bring me an absentee ballot now. He almost said that, but not quite. <laughs> bring me that ballot. Mitch, how is the to-do list? Could we add one more thing? Could we do one more thing? You already know where I'm going. And you know one day if you have that opportunity, you'll be there too. Those things that matter to you now will not matter then. It will be about... It'll be about relationships. It'll be about when you can't even speak anymore. You are so out of breath that you grab a hand and you bring it to your lips and you go and you kiss. Because you still want to convey that's what it's all about. If that's the way it's going to be then, let it be that way now. We are called to invest in people. Glenn Adsit and his wife, boy, they got it. They were over missionaries in China. They wanted to proclaim the gospel. But they were walking this tight uh, little bit of a balance. Proclaim the gospel, get people excited about Jesus, but still wanted to keep it kind of down because if the government finds out, that won't be going on too much longer. Evangelism took hold. The Holy Spirit took off. People began to pray. Christians got excited and the government found out. Glenn Adsit, wife and two children, headed to prison. After a week of prayer, the government relents and says, okay, you're not headed to prison, but back to the U.S. you go, and you are gone in three days. You and your wife, your family, you're out of here. And then they kind of get this little blessing. 200 pounds of personal belongings get to go with you. See you in three days, get on the plane. Glenn and his wife sit down, what are we going to take? Well, the Bible's got to go. Pictures of our family have to go. Pictures of our new uh, Chinese family have to go. That one piece of furniture we brought, that one clock, that one frame that was our great-grandmother's, that was also a missionary, that we brought to remind us of her and who we are now, that's got to go. My sermons have got to go. And they showed up with suitcases packed. They'd weighed them once, twice, three times. Not 199 and a half, not 205. 200 pounds exactly and they set him down on the scales and the Chinese government looks at Glenn and he says have you weighed the children everything that was valuable whew, to the curb and those kids got on the plane let me tell you there's gonna be a day where you go to heaven and the only thing that gets to go with you are relationships other children of the family of God there are things that we are caught up in and worries that we have that need to be kicked to the curb. We need to get out of them. But Mitch, I've signed on for 60 months. We need to begin to pray about things that we can give up now so that we can take hold of heaven where we just don't pray thy kingdom come, but we act and think in an attitude as the same as Jesus. And people matter. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things, just spiritual things, all things, secular things, spiritual things, it's, it's all one thing, grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, that's the elders and the deacons, and the, no, 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 the whole body, every person joined and held together by everyone doing their work, every supporting ligament. Well, it's going to grow and it's going to build itself up in love as each part does its work. Real quick, if you're following along on the back of your handout, make a note of the ABCs of being in a relationship. A, when you're in a body of believers like Central and like Park Plaza, you accept gifts. Right now, there are people down the hall working with kids at a level that I can't even imagine. I taught the three-year-old class about 10 years ago for one quarter. There were three kids in it then. It exhausted me. 
I am not built to do that. I'm not trying to cop out. I brought in Brian McKee. I brought in my wife as quick as I could. I said, these kids, I, I don't get them. I did youth ministry for a dozen years, but three three-year-olds, I'm defeated. I'm thankful we have people here that do that. And I'm humbled when I see them. I have to accept that gift. Th there are some people here that have the gift of giving financially. And they give financially. They give at a level where we bless thousands of people in our food bank, in our clothing ministry, in our furniture ministry, but our whole church gets to be a part of that. I have to accept that gift. I have to be humbled at what they're doing. Last night, 7 o'clock, if you'd pulled up at Jinx West Elementary, you would have seen Troy Tabor pull up in a big old truck, towing a trailer longer than this stage. And our brothers and sisters, 30 of them, show up chairs. I saw Bob Petrie there. Well, Bob Petrie's a member here at Central. What's he doing at Jinx? See, sometimes you have to accept humility. And when you see that example, you go, man, that's what it's about. And there they are serving Tom Walden, Jim and Nancy Powell, on and on, Jerry and Sharon Snedden, the Stacys, the Van Brunts, and people serve. You accept gifts in a body. B, in the ABCs, you get to bestow gifts. Each and every one of us has a gift that we can give. And each and every one of us has to be diligent in finding a way in this body to give that gift. To be someone who understands Jesus promised you it's more blessed to give than receive. And finally, let her see, there's a continuing gift of growth when we prioritize ourselves to relationship. Hebrews 3 and 12 says this, See to it. Well, when your dad told you, see to it, what did that mean? Get it done. Our dad's telling us, see to it. And who's he telling? See to it, world out there. No, no, no. It's to us. See to it, brothers, sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. Oh, no, 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 Lord, Lord, you're talking to the brothers now, not the world. We're all believers, apparently, the Hebrew writer thought the early church could still have a sinful, unbelieving heart. So he's in love, warning them. Hey, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart, a turning away heart from the living God. This can happen, apparently. He wouldn't be warning us if it wasn't a possibility. Well, how do we avoid this? Well, you encourage one another daily as long as it's called the day, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. In the church, we remain in relationship and remission ourselves to relationship because it is what allows us to continue to grow in Christ. Number two, we not only prioritize ourselves to relationship, but we reevaluate living from His ongoing perspective of our lives. Said another way, Jesus always understood. Matthew 6, Father sees what's done in secret. Throughout the Gospels, the Father sees what's done in secret and in the streets. We now, in being like Jesus, reevaluate every step, understanding that God is watching and rooting and caring and loving us. Well, what a difference that makes. And Jesus lived like that. What were Jesus' first words? Why do you seek me, mom and dad? Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? He understood that God was watching. You know, there's a peculiar thing. I don't understand running at all. Uh, some of you that love running, I admire you so much. I have run one 5K, and I don't know if I'll ever do it again. Okay, but anyway, I appreciate runners, but I, I can understand a little bit about it. And the greatest marathon there is, is the Boston Marathon. And for a couple of years, the mathematician runners couldn't understand something about the Boston Marathon. Unlike any other marathon, mile 19 was run faster than any other mile. You say, oh, it was downhill. It's actually uphill. Well, that must just be some place where the body kicks in. Not at other marathons. Uh, in fact, I think we've even got a graph here of mile 19... And there it is. Here's this uptick. You go, well, that must just happen. It doesn't happen at other marathons. 
And interestingly enough, they finally found out what was happening in Boston at mile 19. Wes, how do you say it? Well, Leslie College. I want to say Wesley. Well, Leslie College is an all-girls school on mile 19. <laughs> so guess what those men do at mile 19? They see signs like this. It's hot, but so are you. <laughs> and they run a little bit harder. You know, isn't that an amazing thing? That when you understand that someone is watching you run or remission yourself to the mission of Marathon differently. Same is true with Christ. Old Testament. How many times, all the Old Testament, how many times did they refer to God Almighty as Father? Fourteen. Let's not even take the whole New Testament. Let's just do Jesus. Could one guy alone match all the prophets and all the patriarchs in calling him Abba? Yeah, he hit 14. And then he went on to 156. See, he understood it wasn't just someone watching. I'm your judge and I'm God and I've got a list of who's naughty and nice and I'm watching. Jesus didn't do that. It's my dad. He's watching me. It's my Abba Father, and he's watching me. It's not just someone is watching, someone is witnessing. It is Abba Father. And finally, number three, in being like Jesus, we need to return to the practice of his routine. I preach a lot against routine. I never want to show up on Sundays out of some drudgery. Yeah, it's Sunday morning, it's routine, let's go to church. But there is something to be said about routine. New Testament, as was his custom, Jesus went to the synagogue. As was his habit, as was his custom, early in the morning, he went off to pray. Jesus had routines that were very beneficial. We've been talking a lot about Jesus doing some filling in our lives, living water pouring into us. Todd, come on up, help me out, brother. And as Jesus does some filling, we get to do some spilling. So we've got some filling that Jesus wants to do. But the reason sometimes I don't do a lot of spilling onto people is because Jesus hasn't done a lot of filling into this person. Why hadn't Jesus done a lot of spilling out of you? Well, because he hadn't done a lot of filling in me. Why hasn't that happened? Because sometimes it's hard to hit a moving target. And Jesus understood that. You see, Jesus was fully aware of a scripture that said, Be still and know that I am God. And once we're still, then he fills and now we can spill. I want to do it another way. That's not Jesus' way. Todd, thank you for your help, brother. You know, we're called to be people who understand that we need to be still and know that he's God. In fact, church, this third point is the most important. Because you'll never get your priorities right. You'll never understand that a loving Heavenly Father is watching you if you're not still and allow Him to remind you that those things are true. Philippians 4 and 9 says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, it's kind of like the author has done then. But then he cranks up again. Oh yeah, one more. Not only learned, received, or heard, whatever you've seen in me. Remember when I would go off early in the morning? Remember all the time the people wanted to get to me, but I'd leave them to a quiet place? Jesus said, I've got nothing to spill because I've had nothing filled, so I need to go be still. If Jesus did that, we need to do that. It's what we've seen in him that we put into practice. And the God of peace will be then with you. Romans 12 and 12, be joyful in hope, patient in trials, steadfastly maintain the habit of prayer. James 1 and 25, but the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and makes a habit. I looked into the law of freedom. Yeah, you did it once, Mitch. How about now once a day? The man who makes a habit of doing so, not forgetting what he's heard, but doing it now, 
He's the one that's going to be blessed. The one who makes a habit of being still and now goes out and does the business of making people a priority, who understands that a loving Heavenly Father is watching, it's going to be this person who's blessed. Tomorrow morning, I'm changing my schedule because of this sermon. I've had a Monday morning routine that has now been into mission creep. I'm not only going to begin my Monday, I want to begin my work week with the Lord and none other. No offense to Matt Lauer, but the Today Show is not coming on. No offense to ESPN Sports Center at 6, it's not coming on. I need to be with him. It is this third one, his routine, that makes the other two possible. This morning, of all the relationships you need to make a priority in your life, remember that the one with Christ is that one you need to have most. Have you been putting that off? Don't do it one more day. Come and begin the process as so many others have, as one this past Friday night has done, and be baptized in Him, raised anew in the newness of life of the living water that is now in you and spills out of you. Today, can we pray for you in any way? There's a response card in the pew in front of you. Maybe today you're a guest, and, and, and man, this is a big place. Maybe all you do today is fill this out and drop this off with someone as you leave, and you drop down away, right down away, we begin to pray for you. Today, maybe relationally, you need to be a part of a body of believers that comes alongside you with the ABCs, where you accept gifts, where you bestow gifts, and you continue to grow in gifts. And if any of these ways, would you come now as we stand and as we sing? I am mine no more.